before, we were looking at this just example of the, the horseshoe vortex and the fact that we're saying it's not a, it's not a particularly controversial idea that, you know, that form is produced in, in water. But where we're going to go next, I'll sort of walk you through as we step up in scale. What also happens is that um, this idea of meltwater, that those amounts of, I should say, that those quantities of meltwater producing those kinds of landforms and including drumlins as we move beyond this, uh, this is not mainstream idea. They're not widely accepted idea. Like the, this meltwater hypothesis of Shaw has always been and continues to be a fairly contentious issue and, and controversial. And so um, I don't want to give people the wrong impression that this is sort of a settled argument at all. It's far from that. Right. I want to go through some of the arguments that have been used to support this idea and to build it from uh, the, the beginning. But the more we move into you know, the next few slides, the less, the more controversial it becomes. The, you know, I don't think that many people argue the fact that these bedrock eroded forms are not a product of water in, in large part, though there's all obviously evidence of abrasion by ice as well. But as we start scaling up the size of drumlins, what also happens is this, the amount of water that is required also increases radically. And this is where the, the idea becomes increasingly controversial. Okay, so we can sort of chat about how that gets to be that way, but I'll just, I'll tell you right now, that's where we're going. So more examples of what happens when, for example, you have a flow that encounters an obstacle. We're talking about these uh, French river forms uh, being at escarpment. So you can see, I think my cursor shows up. There's a, a positive step here. We basically go from a low-lying area up a, a step, and then there's a flat platform surface that's sculpted on the bedrock. And so you have to picture that as the flow was going from the bottom right to the top left, it's impinging or it's encountering an obstacle, a positive step, as we call it. So there's like a, a bit of a, think of a, a staircase and there's one step in the way and then you get onto that flat surface. And so um, if you model this, computer models or uh, hydraulic modeling of flows encountering what we call a positive step, so here's the best way to think about it. There's our bedrock surface and then there's the low-lying area upflow. We encounter the step and we go over it. What we're able to see are patterns of turbulence and, in this case, patterns of erosion that might be produced that are entirely compatible with the patterns that we see in the bedrock. In other words, what we see is you encounter a stop, uh, uh, pardon me, a step. It doesn't stop the flow. It actually, what we tend start seeing is a lot of uh, turbulence at the bottom of the step, but also the tendency for the flow to overcome the step and stream across the top. Right, so the flow gets focused along the top in these streamlines across the obstacle. And those happen to correspond also to the general elongation of, you know, the erosion along the flanks of the, the bedrock residual. So, you know, there's this aspect of erosion to produce individual forms. But if you start thinking about groupings of forms that occur on positive bedrock steps, that's also consistent. The pattern we're seeing is also consistent with what we understand of how uh, fluids move over these steps. Okay, so the modeling in this case was done in part to try to understand, hey, what does happen when this flow of water under the ice might encounter a step? And then it produces patterns that are certainly compatible with what we're seeing in the bedrock. This uh, suite of forms that we see in bedrock, whether it's the one on the bottom right, which is Kelly's Island, or this is from French River area. Uh, in the 90s, one of John's, I think, colleagues, uh, and John as well, John Shaw's colleague, mapped a, a range of these forms and they kind of produced this atlas and they said hey you know there's actually a whole collection of these patterns of bedrock erosion that are produced by water and so they tried to sort of create this nomenclature and some you'll know right so potholes you know what those pot what potholes are we see these in rivers but uh, we also see them clearly in those areas that have been glaciated in uh, combination with the ones that tend to be horseshoe shaped you were asking about the Musselbrush. this is this one here Right, like a scoop mark. Uh, they can also be kind of like conduit. So there's a whole host of these forms that can be encompassed or gathered and put together in the same kind of category of bedrock erosional forms. So here's where things get a bit more um, complex and where the controversy also rises a bit. When this French river work was done, so that big outcrop I've been showing you, if you go on the ground, you start seeing the details of the sculpting. And you can see, and we're talking about these delicate rims that are 
preserved and you can see the areas, areas of erosion and the moats that are filled with water is these little ponds or little puddles around it. What you also see is that the bedrock surface is covered in boulders, nothing else. So if it's been abraded by ice, uh, either we expect that there's a lot of removal of sediment and there's not much left on the surface, or we might expect to have a cover of till or outwash, but there's conspicuously what's absent is everything smaller than some boulders at a critical size. There's what we call a lag of boulders, meaning it's boulders of a given size or, or class of a given size that are left behind. Everything smaller has been stripped away. And so um, in that interpretation of these boulders being a lag, the idea is that you had flows moving over that surface and it were, they were sufficiently powerful to entrain, mobilize and remove entirely the particles that are smaller than these boulders. So these become essentially markers of a critical velocity of the flows that move over those surfaces. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everything finer gets stripped away and we, we leave behind what can't be moved given the velocity uh, that's required to move a boulder like that. And if you look at boulders individually, they're also full of these percussion marks as if they've been sort of mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly hit by other class. So as you're in the process of stripping away all the finer particles and these boulders are either not moving or barely moving, everything else is shooting by and flowing by and they're, in, they're, they're bumping and hitting those boulders. And so those boulders kind of get bombarded with all kinds of other class. And so they get this, this pop mark and these impact, these percussion marks as they're called. Um, and that's another clue that perhaps these are in fact lags, meaning that they're left behind. Now those boulders are, they're of different composition than the bedrock there? I don't know. I don't, I mean, we're on the shield in this area, I think, and I think it's fairly uniform in composition. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, really what matters, I mean, there's going to be some slight differences in the density of different rocks, but they're not going to be radically different to the point of, you know, really changing the velocity that's required to move. Right. Okay. I guess I wasn't thinking so much that other than the fact that, you know, how far they had to be transported before right. they were, um, before they were placed there. Because I yeah. think, yeah, I think well, we if, can assume they're not autochthonous, right? Um, not necessarily, though when you, call, when you start calling things a lag, the implication is that they haven't moved far. Okay, okay. Okay, they've basically been stationary because the flow is incapable of moving them. Gotcha. But everything so else moves. It, the fines have been washed away. Everything smaller is stripped away. Yeah, yeah, got exactly. It. Though they may have rolled a bit or moved a bit, but mm -hmm. okay, um, it's not like we're talking about the load of a the sediment load of a river that's traveling. You know, because if if they have been transported, it's very possible, if not probable, that they were actually transported within the I, the glacier mass itself. They could be absolutely. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. and they may well have been transported in ice and been deposited at some point or been part of till, but then this water event happens and then we right. strip away all the other part, finer particles that might have been in the till and we preferentially leave behind right. these, these boulders. So we can take their size, we can make a few estimates on their density if we need to, and we can arrive at, uh, we can make some estimates on the, the velocities that are required to move these boulders. And so it gives us an upper limit on how fast the flows have to be moving to um, strip these away and move them around. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm, I'm going to say five, five to eight meters per second, maybe a bit more, maybe around 10 meters per second to move them. Now, if you map these, these broad areas of bedrock that have been sculpted, you realize that uh, this is Georgian Bay. And so this is on land, there's a, this is a shoreline essentially around the, the red line. You realize that there's, first of all, remarkable uh, similarity in the paleo currents. In other words, you know, if you take the forms and you, you map their long axes, you get an idea of their direction. And it's remarkably similar across the entirety of this northern part of Georgian Bay. So they map them, they being John and I think his, uh, his colleague mostly, Bill Kaur, uh, they map them and they come up with this distribution of these bedrock sculpted areas. And then they would have, they argued that there's no real evidence of cross-cutting between the, the sets of bedrock forms. And they all have really consistent orientations. So by that logic, maybe they all form at the same time. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you produce them, they're, um, what you see in terms of the extent is actually the extent of the flow that makes them, right? If you start seeing cross-cutting patterns or some variation in the direction, uh, 
Um, perhaps you're looking at you know different episodes of formation for each one, but in this argument, they're arguing continuity of the the development across the landscape, and that therefore they're arguing also that there's a continuity of the flow. The width of the flow is basically the width of the area that you mapped. So you take the width of the flow, you take uh, the critical size of the boulders for a velocity. You have an idea of how deep the flow must have been to overcome some of these escarpments. And if you multiply or if you do that, if you have those three variables, you can come up with a discharge. You got a velocity, you got a depth, and you got a width of flow. And uh, you come up with numbers that are in the 10 to the 7 sort of range, right? We're, we're basically into mega flood scale discharges in terms of meters cubed per second for discharges. So very right. quickly, the width here, you know, if you look at the scale, this is roughly 60 or 70 kilometers in terms of the width of the proposed flows to produce these forms. So a 70 kilometer wide flow that's about 10 meters deep and is moving at a velocity of somewhere around eight to 10 meters per second, if I recall correctly. And if you calculate that, then you'd end up basically on the, if you look at these charts of, you know, super floods or mega floods, we're on, uh, this end of the chart, you know, we're on sort of Missoula scale discharges going through that area of, uh, of French River. Mm, but I did warn you that sort of this is kind of the, the controversial parts of it. The most controversial part of this argument in this calculation is the width of the flow. Mm -hmm. It's really truly, is this truly a 70 kilometer wide flow? I mean, if you try to picture that, yeah. that's, this is not in a, in a well-established river channel or something like that. This is a transient event where uh, it would presumably be potentially, I mean, if you go from the mapping, 70 kilometers wide. Right? Which, Which is about 45 miles, roughly. 45 miles wide, um, moving at a velocity that moves everything or strips away everything except the largest boulders we saw in those photos. So, you know, I said earlier that the meltwater hypothesis is not something that is widely accepted it's it's controversial and part of the, the controversy stems from the fact that you know uh the implication of recognizing that some of these forms might be made by water creates very quickly a need for absolutely staggering amounts of water like the volumes of water are uh, incredibly large because you know georgian bay is one small part of one of those flow tracks that i showed you on that map earlier Right? It's a very tiny portion of the entire map of drumlins and streamlined landforms across Canada and the Lower Tide Ice Sheet. It's a relatively small area compared to the full size of the ice sheet. And it still requires a discharge on the scale of Glacial Lake Missoula mm -hmm. as, a, as a point of comparison. I'll just throw in that 10 to the 7th cubic meters is about roughly 350 million cubic feet per second, which is in the size range of the, the flow that carved uh, Grand Coulee. Yeah. About half of what Vic Baker uh, calculated for um, the Rathdrum Prairie Spokane Valley area, but about roughly the same as JT Pardee calculated for Eddie Narrows in the Clark Fork. Yeah. Just for comparison. And we mm -hmm. haven't really talked about that. We haven't really gotten into the Scablands yet and the Missoula floods and all of that. But just for comparison, when we come back to it, it'll be interesting to contrast this, you know, when we're looking at pictures of Grand Coulee and the, the, the flows, the peak discharges there, the peak discharges through the Clark Fork at the, uh, the Glacial Dam outlet to compare it back to what you're showing us here, that we're looking at roughly 10 to the 7 cubic meters per second. And yeah, like you said, truly phenomenal flows. And, you know, it's funny you bring up the Scablands and, and uh, Pardee and Brett's because one of the one of the obstacles, I guess, the widespread acceptance of this idea of meltwater uh, as being this agent of producing these landforms is just the fact that it requires so much water. And so often the argument has been, well, if there's so much water needed, where is it? Where does it come from? Which are, not, which are arguments that are actually not that different from exactly what Brett's faced in terms of counter arguments to dismiss his idea. He had, exactly. he had, he had landforms that he couldn't explain other than, you know, they, they seemed extraordinary and there were patterns that he could recognize that were obviously not what you'd expect from a normal river. So he had a, a huge amount of process-based arguments and field evidence 
And the Achilles heel in his argument seemed to be for a long time that he had no water source or it required so much water. People say, well, how can you produce that much water? Where does it come from and where is it stored and on and so forth? And that's exactly what many people have sort of uh, argued to say, okay, well, if this, if these forms 70 kilometers wide, and then we'll see in a second, even bigger with drumlins, uh, that requires lots of water. Where is it? And until you can tell us where it is, where it comes from and how much there is and where you store it, uh, that doesn't make, you know, we can't sort of, we can't go with this. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there's, there's some parallels there in terms of, of the argumentation that's been used to counter some of those, those ideas. We, we've talked about exactly that uh, several times on the show. And yeah. the, the parallels between Brett's reception and, and John Shaw's reception and how kind of this, the, 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 the criticisms kind of essentially were, were similar in both cases. Where's, yeah. where's the source? of the water and no. i think oh john at one point i think tried to invoke a subglacial reservoir perhaps in hudson bay basin didn't he yeah. and then perhaps kind of played around with the idea of superglacial waters but without actually um coming down definitively i don't think at any given source did he yeah or did he have an idea i think he had many ideas and i think there yeah. are different possibilities yeah. Um, I mean, at the same time, you, you can dismiss the, you, you, you might want to dismiss the argument to say, well, um, there's enough landform evidence that sort of points towards water that I shouldn't have to tell you where the water comes from. But it, it, it is an issue. I mean, you have to sort of, at some point you have yeah. to face that reality yeah. that it requires lots of water. So mm -hmm. you can't just not answer and not address <laughs> that question. Right. Well, yeah. But, um, the, the, I guess the, 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 the real challenge is, is when people dismiss it and say, well, we don't have, for example, analogs of that much storage of water. Okay, well, then, then we run into it. We get into a territory where, well, who's to say that the analogs we see today, where we have water and glaciers either underneath or on top, are exactly what, what we would have had as we were deglaciating potentially a very large continental ice sheet. Right. So those arguments get fairly complex pretty quickly. But, I mean, personally, I think that at some point you have to account for the water. And it is possible that, you know, some of the areas that have been mapped and argued to be major flood tracks, I mean, if you can't, if you can't supply them with water, then it's difficult to make that argument fully. So there's some, perhaps some adjustment to be made in terms of the, uh, the arguments. But, you know, this is sort of going down a bit of a rabbit hole. But I, it, you were talking about Brett, so, you know, it's an interesting parallel there. And so to your question on what, you know, from discussions I had with John Shaw, yeah, he had lots of ideas, either subglacial lakes in different places, superglacial lakes, so on top of the ice. Uh, he worked quite a bit for a few years with a colleague or a friend who was in Vancouver, who was a mathematician who kind of uh, got really interested in this question, Ed Shoemaker. And Ed Shoemaker did some interesting modeling where he argued that you could actually pool lots and lots of small puddles of water under a glacier. You know, there's some basic sort of geometric relationships between the slope of the bed or obstacles on the bed and the slope on the ice surface that allow you to pool water. And so instead of arguing or trying to find one gigantic reservoir of water, Shoemaker was sort of more leading towards the idea of having a, a, a number of small ones distributed across a very large area. And then all you really needed is some system or some way of connecting them. So you could have water on top of the ice that drains to the bed, something that we see today in Greenland happening almost seasonally. And as that water connects to the bed, it kind of connects all these other puddles together or something like that. And so I, there was a lot of thought given to that pretty thorny problem of, you know, where is all this water coming from? Well, it certainly does seem, though, like when we look at the, the vast scale of the drumlin fields, that what we need is some kind of a chronology. I mean... How are we, I mean, to what extent were these things happening simultaneously? What, how, what extent were they time transgressive? Yeah. You know, did we see the earliest drumlin swarms? Uh, to me, I would have to think that it's correlated with the meltwater pulses. Because we have at least three meltwater pulses. You know, James Teller's work mm -hmm. um, yep. up in the mid-continental region. We've been talking about his work for a couple of episodes now, but... Um, you know, he, the, the, and, and the idea, the new work now showing possible catastrophic drainage of Lake Agassiz. Yeah. So, you know, draining into the Arctic and so on. I think 
we have to address this problem in the context of the entire deglacial sequence. Yeah. Which I think is clearly not a uniform process. It there there were discrete events within yeah. that melting process. So I mean, for Agassiz, the drainage is is, is proglacial, right? So it's not yeah. it's not the source, or it's not. But I mean, I take your point that there might have been earlier events mm-hmm. prior to Agassiz that drained subglacially, or even some perhaps after. Um, yeah. and but, Agassiz but they, had have the, to be big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. And there was a there's a paper from the John had worked with somebody else who had, was doing some work in on coral reefs in the I think the Gulf of Mexico and they mm-hmm. they were showing episodes of um, reef drowning and pulses of water essentially coming to the Gulf of Mexico very large amounts that with timing he, that might well coincide with some of these proposed big floods. Yeah, he called them CREs, catastrophic yes. rise events. There you go. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking about. You know, is that yeah. I, we need to be looking at these patterns of sea level rise because clearly that's the ice complex melting. Yeah. So we need to be looking at de- the whole deglacial sequence, I think, to make sense out of this. And all of the evidence for mega floods and drumlins, particularly if they end up being fluvial, and I always tend towards the term glaciofluvial because that encompasses the, the, the whole spectrum of possibilities. Some yeah. combination of ice and water, maybe dominant one or dominant the other, but clearly it does involve the the presence of the ice, first of all. And then and, and clearly the ice is gone now. So we know it melted. We can we we can pretty much assume that. So in that process of melting, clearly there's going to be copious amounts of meltwater generated. And this meltwater has to, I would think leave a geomorphic imprint. Yeah, and the, I think the, the corollary to that is that those events, as they're proposed, they're so big that they would, they would likely have an offshore signature. Yeah, and an, exactly. Right, yeah. and that mm-hmm. offshore signature would be, I mean, you just got to look at what, what are your outlets? You've got the Gulf of St. Lawrence, you've got the Mississippi, mm-hmm. uh, and then you've got the Columbia. I mean, we know that Missoula has an offshore record. Mm-hmm. Best story of uh, fan. Exactly. Plus, actually, in, in British Columbia, like, there's there's plumes of fresh water coming during Missoula that travel. Though they don't sink like the turbidity currents that go to the Astoria Fan. They actually rise and they disperse in different directions. And so there's... Um, like splayed out from the mouth. That's right. There. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then through the Arctic and Hudson Bay, and there's some... I mean, this is yet another rabbit hole of discussion, but, you know, the North Atlantic has this really intriguing, enormous submarine... Uh, braid plane and fan system that comes out of Hudson's Bay. So it's called the NAMOC, North Atlantic Mid-Ocean mm. Channel. It's a very, very large submarine fan. It's hundreds of kilometers in length. Mm. And it's extremely coarse. And there's a lot, you know, it's tied, it's kind of implicated in Heinrich events and mm-hmm. those episodes, but there's a lot of evidence for a lot of water, meltwater essentially draining from the ice sheet to form this braid plane because it's under four kilometers of water. It's, it's on the floor of the North Atlantic. Wow. And it's sculpted and it's got levees, got a set of levees bigger than the Mississippi levees. Um, and so there's there's potentially some offshore records that might point towards some of those major events. Yeah. But again, connecting all that through time, as you're saying, the chronology is really critical. And so we're we're kind of dealing with little pieces here and there and trying to see how we might link them up. But yeah, I will interject just for, for the record that we don't mind going down rabbit holes. Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, there's a lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots. Well, I've sort of got another one there. I didn't want to interrupt, but you did start to kind of get into it with the subglacial pondings or lakes. Yeah. You know, with that previous image, if that's 40 plus miles wide, or you said 70 kilometers, right? I think the obvious question from amateur like me, what's holding up the ice? How much ice, how thick is the ice on top of that? What's supporting the ice? Is it floating in some way? Or I, yeah. I mean, that's just that's a huge expanse to not be holding up all that ice. That's right. And so, um, yeah. So if you, if you start ponding water under the ice sheet, uh, the shear stress at the bed drops down to nothing. And so the ice, if it, if the lake is big enough, the puddle of water is big enough and it's under sufficient pressure, then the ice essentially floats on top or rests on top of the water. And at that point it can thin really quickly. So, if you envisage that you had an ice sheet where there was lots and lots of puddles, 
of water, however big they might be, um, you'd expect the ice surface to respond to those pools of water on the bed. And the ice would respond by thinning and flattening. And so how, how thick was the ice over that area? I mean, that's a very good question. It's tricky to answer that question. I mean, the best we can do on the Laurentide often is try to work backwards from the isostatic rebound of the landscape and sort of try to work backwards to say, okay, how much ice does it take to, to deform the crust to a point where it will produce this much rebound after deglaciation? And we sort of work our way back that way. Um, but if you throw in the extra variable of having water pooled under the ice, then the ice thickness might change pretty radically. Uh, sure. It would certainly be uneven. Yet with water pooled, you'd still have a load on the crust. So you could still produce uh, some amount of isostatic depression, mm -hmm. right? So you, you could still see the isostatic effect that you have today, but um, you, know, you might be assuming entirely that it's from a load of ice, not a load of ice and water necessarily. I think the challenging part here, though, is to get the ponded. You have to get the ponded water moving. That's right. So somehow you have to you have to integrate the whole dis disparate mass of separate ponds and then get them moving. And how do you do that? That's right. So I mean, if you look at modern environments where we're seeing this happening, Greenland is probably a good example. In Greenland, there are lakes. There there are pools of water that form under the ice sheet. They can form. Some of them are seasonal, some of them are multi-seasonal. But what's happening more and more, because the Greenland ice sheet is melting fairly rapidly, is you get melt ponds on the surface. And those melt ponds um, drain through crevasses in the ice. And so it's a bit like a hydraulic wedge. You, start, you fill up a crevasse and it produces a slake on the surface. And then there's enormous amounts of pressure at the bottom of that crevasse that's filled with water and that's enough to actually wedge the ice open to a point where it actually connects to the bed at some point it hits the the bottom of the ice and then the water drains like this bathtub straight through the bottom and now flows at the bed and what you tend to see happen there in some cases the ice can lift a little bit um, or the the flow can spread outside of existing channels a bit there's just so much pressure and, and volume of water that it spreads some of those drainages make it all the way to the front of the glacier but some of them don't necessarily. Some kind of flow somewhere and they don't fully exit the glacial system. So there's a lot of complex hydraulics happening in those glaciers. But one way to get, you know, if you're thinking back to say the Laurentide ice sheet, one obvious way to get to initiate a drainage, because that's what you would need. You'd need some kind of trigger to initiate a drainage to produce, you know, to sort of release all this water that would then be potentially capable of eroding some of the bedrock forms we see. Uh, that super glacial, that lake on top of the ice connecting to the bottom hydraulically uh, is a really good mechanism to do that because that water has got lots and lots of head in terms of being able to connect and then link up lakes or puddles of water and then initiate the drainage. You know, you, 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 you got to see it as a like this dynamic equilibrium in terms of you pull water but you have to hold the water back and you hold the water back either because you have uh, fairly thick ice or you got bedrock obstacles or you can even have it because you've got some sort of like temperature differences but at some point you can overcome this this threshold and that's what initiates the drainage right so there's multiple ways of doing that in the cordillera uh, is another example where, where it's arguably easier to pond water because you get all these valleys uh, you could do it because we we there's a record of say uh, volcanoes erupting under the ice and so that's a, a mechanism by which you might produce lots of water very quickly which overcomes a threshold which initiates a drainage. Okay. So I think, yeah, you, you kind of hit that. I think, you know, it has to overcome quickly, whatever. I yeah. Mean, the, it has to overcome the threshold relatively quickly. And I know These there are some pretty large lakes uh, under the Antarctic ice sheet. Yeah. There are but, many lakes under the Antarctic yeah. ice sheet. I mean, every year there's more and there's hundreds of them under the Antarctic ice sheet. The larger ones, though, tend to be in bedrock basins. They're not That's actually right. contained by the ice itself. Yeah. You can almost remove the ice, and you're still going to have this lake there. Yeah. Maybe along the lines of, you know, look at some of the, you know, Great Slave Lake. You know, that mm -hmm. was glaciated. Now it's a lake. Was, yeah. there ever a, was there ever a lake in that basin under the Laurentide Ice Sheet? I asked that question about Lake Pend and the Purcell Trench Lobe. 
where I, I haven't really seen the, the basin of what, 1,500 feet deep of Lake Pend Oreille, was that, at what point was that sculpted out? Mm -hmm. was, was that glacially sculpted when the ice dam presumably existed holding in Lake Missoula? Was there a lake, was there a subglacial lake in the basin of Lake Pend Oreille? And I think that's a, an important question because not to get off on Lake Missoula now, because I'd like to get back to Drumlins, but my problem there is if you've got you've got a hydraulic head of 2,100 feet on the upglacial side, you've got Lake Columbia lapping at the toe of the ice dam on the other side, and then if there's a body of water under the lobe itself, how do you have all of that water without having hydraulic connectivity between the, the water outside the dam, the water inside the dam, and the water under the dam? Mm -hmm. That's where I kind of get like I'd like to talk to some engineers and see what they think about that. Yeah. Because that's where I kind of question the whole efficacy of the ice dam model. Mm -hmm. But that's a subject for another discussion.